What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders uh, like the founders of RX Bars. They end up selling to Kellogg for $600 million. You can check out the interview with Peter and how they built it up. Uh, P90X founder Tony Horton talks about how he made money as a street mime, Stormy, and that's how he made money for food and rent is he put a hat out do his mime thing and make money and he went on to sell hundreds of millions of dollars of p90x baby einstein founder julie clark sold over 30 million copies of the kids books but she talks about how she beat cancer twice uh really fascinating that much more check out inspired insider.com where all the episodes are um this episode is brought to you by rise 25 which i co-founded with my business partner john corcoran our mission is really to connect you with your best referral partners and customers, and we do that through our Done For You podcast solution, which in my opinion is the best thing I've done for my business and my life. And when I say that stormy in front of my wife, she doesn't like that. So I said, besides getting married, besides kids, but really it's I've not seen any other way to give to someone else and to form a relationship and to profile them. And so basically we help people show up um and have that conversation with our best referral partners clients and we do everything else put it across all the different channels all the podcasting channels social media etc um we do have a greater purpose for what we do and we discovered john and i, I don't know if, when you talk to john he he talked about this but my grandfather was a holocaust survivor who escaped nazi germany and his brother and him were the only people to survive uh, the entire family and john's at the same time his grandfather was a b-17 captain and pilot who flew 35 missions over nazi germany so to honor our grandfather's legacy we have a veteran entrepreneur scholarship um, so if you go to rise25.com slash mission um, and you know a veteran entrepreneur you are one you can apply and what that is is it gets you a ticket uh, sometimes all expense paid trip to a vip event that we're running or a ticket to the conference we're going to or whatever it is so go to rise25.com slash mission I'm excited to chat to today's guest, Stormy Simon, and she is former president of Overstock.com. She joined in 2001 during the formative years of e-commerce, and at the time, revenue was less than $20 million with a staff of under 100 people, and in her career, she's got a really interesting, amazing career trajectory, and I'm just talking Overstock, and we'll get into some of the background, but gone from executive assistant to VP of branding, to VP of customer care, to CMO, to eventually president. And during her tenure, Overstock became a top 25 e-tailer by traffic and grew to nearly $2 billion in revenue and had approximately 1,600 employees. Uh, so it's amazing. And during her presidency, a more impressive thing is the female seats at the executive table increased to 33%. Um, and it's really underserved. Stormy, and even the events that we are at or or we go to or we run, we feel like it's really underserved. The female entrepreneur um, is underserved in that. And in 2016, she stepped down as president of Overstock to explore the emerging cannabis industry, which is booming. So follow whatever Stormy does because whatever she's doing tends to be a hockey stick up into the right. So she's you know, exploring the cannabis industry. She serves on the advisory board for Canna Kids and is director on the board of High Times. She was even, I was reading, um, announced one of the 2019 Women Weed Honorees. Um, and in the past, she was named by Utah's Women Tech Council Top Innovator, and she was named Power Player by the National Retail Federation. Stormy, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. There's so much to talk about, but I figured um, you'd give people a sense of, and, and anyone who hasn't listened to your TED Talk, by the way, needs to listen to it. I probably listened to it three times at this yeah, point. And talk about the evolution of your jobs from starting from high school forward. Yeah. Well, my very first job was taco time. And... I loved it. I was 15. You were supposed to be 16, but I was 15. I want to start working. You know, we didn't have a lot of money to buy school clothes or 
a lot of extracurricular activity for all the kids. So there weren't a lot of us. There were four, relatively speaking, in Utah. There were only four of us in my family. <laughs> um, but, you know, so it was like try to go to work as soon as you can. And uh, my first job was taco time. And I learned a lot uh, just at that. Um, you know, not long after, I became a mom. And so I took a little time out. Was this but in I, high school or right after high school? It was the senior year senior of high year. school. Yeah. Yeah. It was that year. I had stopped going to the traditional high school and was going to a mommy school ish. I call it mommy school. It was a great setup for, you know, people in my situation or mm. folks where traditional high school wasn't working. Okay. Um, so yeah, I went to that and then, you know, I moved around a little bit, worked at a Peter Piper pizza in Arizona and I have a food thing. Like, food is not a good industry for me to work in. You know, I worked at the Hard Rock Cafe once as a sales director that we'd get to. But once I was touching the food, I found it really hard to eat at restaurants. Mm. And I will say that everywhere I worked was super clean and stuff. But, you know, it had to be. Um, I just, I'm not meant to touch food. I stop. It's really weird. <laughs> so I figured that out pretty young. <laughs> Um, and went on, I took this really interesting job. It turned out to be interesting uh, across the street from where I lived in San Diego, which was um, at a video store. So back when the video to home, right, you're used to going to the movie and all of a sudden we can rent these videos in our home. I worked at one of those stores. It turned out to be a really good move. Later when I had moved back to Utah and I was going to the community college, I took a job um, at a video distribution company because it turned out Salt Lake City was a hub. So there were three of them there, and I took a job, you know, for the summertime in between quarters to go um, be a receptionist for $6.50 an hour. And I got in there, and it was really a fun environment. It was kind of my – I had worked in an office before, but this was, like, my first prominent position. And what happened was on about my fourth day there – I sat in front of this little wall as the receptionist and you could roll your chair back and look behind the wall at all the people, you know. So I got a call for someone and I didn't know if they were on their phone. So I rolled my chair back to look and I was like, hey, Angela or whoever. And my chair flipped over and I was like in a dress and it was a minute. And I, I mean, I think those situations are always really funny. So I found myself laughing. The next day, the boss pulls me in and he says, you handled that situation really well. Like you were laughing and most people would have been, you know, I don't know, embarrassed or something. But there was, you know, it wasn't my fault that I fell. <laughs> and he asked me if I wanted to be his executive assistant because mm. his assistant was leaving at the end of the week. Mm. So that particular job took me into a, a company with five branches, um, a headquarters in Houston. And I got this real insight into how businesses are structured. You know, mm. it was back in the day where you'd go in and meeting with your boss and take notes. And, you know, so I was in, you know, five presidents from these branches were in a meeting and I just started understanding, you know, it was the mm. first time where I was in a business where I was like, oh, I get it. Like, this is how it connects and works. And I was looking at, you know, you're flying the service. wall and absorbing everything. As it's going yes, I but I was a part of it because of that position. Hmm. Being the executive to the president was, I mean, assistant to the president was a great position. Um, and I loved it. Uh, through that, you know, there was, I stayed in that, that industry, joined another company, moved up, you know, started doing co-op advertising where I was writing the radio spots for the regions, um, for these movies that were coming out, and multitudes of video stores. We're not talking like Blockbuster. It was way before Blockbuster. Mm. So everybody was this entrepreneur, similar to what cannabis is today, actually. Everybody was just popping up their shops and making it work, and then it started consolidating, and then you got the big guys in. Mm. Um, I worked there, but that job, writing those spots and being media buying across the Western United States led me to being the promotion director mm. for Salt Lake City radio station. What did media and, buying look like in the, at that time? Like now um, it would obviously be like Facebook ads or Instagram ads there. What was it like then? You know, it was literally calling your regional rep for, you know, the radio stations, which by the way, weren't consolidated yet. Mm. They were all independent mom and pop radio stations. And so just re well, you actually didn't have to call them. They were constantly calling you. It was an influx of folks once they knew you had money. And 
um, you would literally get your schedule on paper. You know, we weren't emailing and stuff. It was the old school days. And then you'd make your buys, you know, and you just divide your your budget. Mm. You know, but I was spying and selling radio um, or buying media ads for probably 150 different stores mm. across, you know, the Western United States. So it was pretty broad. What was next? Um, from there, I went to the radio station, local here in Utah, Cable 93, and it had just launched, and I joined as a promotion director. Um, it was really interesting when I entered that job. I had zero idea what that even meant. I didn't even know what a promotion director was, and they had just changed from old classic rock to country, so listeners were mad, and there was all this changing in management, so I was promotion director with a bunch of interim managers, and I had no idea what that job was, and then I was trying to figure it out, and then a couple months in, thank God, the morning show asked me to join them as a producer, Hmm. so... I went on air and started and learned how to actually produce a radio show, but it was another transforming industry at the time because when I joined, we were putting like CDs into the computer for our spots and our music. But when I left, we it was all digital and all on- online. So everything, all our gigs that we were recording and our comedy routines, we were doing it on the computer and editing it differently hmm. than when I started. So it really had transformed. The other thing that happened on my way out was the consolidation. Like I worked with Citadel Communications and they had just started gathering. You know, I might have tried a little harder in radio had I known that XM and, you know, players like that were going to emerge. But Mm -hmm. uh, once I got fired, because we got fired, uh, I didn't want to go back into radio. I felt like it would take me around a lot. I was a single mom. I didn't have the luxury of just going from city to city. And that led me in destination management. And I worked for a local Salt Lake City organization that handled groups from 15 to 15,000. So we would put on conventions, do large events, tours, um, anything that a convention might need. And so I worked for them for a while as the director of their convention staffs. And then I went to the Hard Rock Cafe for three months. And, you know, I've got stories, you know, within here about these bosses, but this one was funny, but I won't tell it. Um, <laughs> Now and you have to tell it. I do. Do you want me to tell it? It's kind of a, I'll tell it. Okay. So the guy, um, this is right before the Olympics, or maybe it was right after. Um, the Hard Rock Cafe had opened in Salt Lake City. It was a huge deal. And I had been in um, destination management and events. So I developed this relationship with them. We did a lot of um, events there. And they asked me to come on as sales director. And that seemed like a wonderful idea. They've got all these locations. How great would it be? Went to the training, came back. And the guy that I worked for, um, it was really an old school, not old school, but there were, it was all men. And there were just, you know, the GM and then the restaurant managers, however that worked. But they would have these management Like an meetings. old boys club type of thing. Yeah. They would have management meetings and I wouldn't be invited. And then, but as the sales manager and the numbers, and I didn't know it was being reported, but this was immediate. This was, I was there 90 days total, if that. I know it was within the 90 days. And one day, I had interviewed like the people that would greet you. And there was this woman that came in and she was a little rounder, but she was totally funky. She had this infectious laugh. She was hysterical. And, you know, we prided ourselves in being able, because we were a hard rock cafe, you could hire people with different colored hair and you could. You know, and everyone met this woman and they all thought she was warm and sweet and funny, like just fun. And it was my choice. And I went to the guy and said, this is my choice. Everyone's met her. They all loved her. And he said we couldn't hire her because she wasn't aesthetically, visually pleasing enough. Hmm. So I said, you know, obviously what? Might have dropped some swear words, probably not appropriate, but I did. I was, I couldn't believe it. And mm. he said, you just can't have somebody answer in the door that isn't really pretty. And in Utah, you can find all these people. And I said, I, I don't remember the argument in specifics anymore. But then he said to me, well, do you think you would have been hired had you not been attractive? Mm. I think my next word started with an F and the last one was you. And then I walked out the door. And so I'm not sure if I quit or was fired, but that's how the Hard Rock Cafe went, which is shocking. I mean, they're a great organization. The people there are great. But that was my one experience with the mm. guy. 
Lake City. Not good. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, but it is. It is what it is. Um, I don't know who replaced me, but I hope she was stunning, or he. <laughs> He was stunning. Um, after Hard Rock, I moved to Vegas. I actually did another restaurant job here. It's like a startup restaurant, and it was I can't work with food. I moved to Vegas for a startup, and September 11th happened. Mm. And I moved home. I moved in with my mom and was, like, questioning everything. I had three months of money that I could use, you know, and probably get into a place and – live with my mom and it was winter time and I just thought I'll just hang out with my mom for a minute and then about you know two weeks of minutes in it I was like I need to get out of this house and get a job my mom and I can't hang out 24 hours a day even though it sounds like a great thing and I loved her immensely it was too much and that led me to walk into a temp agency and that was the first time you know I was introduced to Overstock Hmm. and went to my interview and the next day, I think I went to an interview on one day, and the next day I went back and interviewed with Patrick, and the next day I started. Hmm. You know, sorry, we'll talk about Overstock, but um, I want to just rewind for you're in high school. You have a child. <laughs> okay. Um, what were you thinking? I don't know if you were at the time, you know, in high school before child. What were you thinking you'd want to do, you know, when you, grew, quote, unquote, grew up? for a living and then did that change once you had a child when I was 11 years old well even before I was 11 but I have these memories of like sitting down and rewriting commercials on TV Mm. and rewriting people's branding campaigns really wow yeah but it was much more simple than that because I was like seven and I was like you know we should be I don't even remember them I I know I had one from Oscar Mayer I totally had an Oscar Mayer one I know one of them but I think I was much older, like was a Huggies one. And, you know, there would be like I had a UPS one. and um, But I would just rewrite these commercials and then make my parents listen to me, tell them what the commercial should be. <laughs> so I think somewhere in there was some right. sort of dream, like an insight into how my brain worked. Hmm. You know, as I got older, I would play, like almost play secretary where I was like, someday I'm just going to type and I'm going to do, I'm going to have a briefcase. And, you know, so I dreamed of looking like a certain woman, you know, and being wearing pump shoes, like high heels and feel, you know, but not knowing what that meant. Hmm. Um, In my mind, it meant secretary, really as a little girl, like um, one day I'll, I'll be like, you know, Mrs. Wahiggins on the Carol Burnett show. <laughs> I don't know what made me think <laughs> um, But that's what I thought of. And then as I got into high school, you know, I was a rebel. I got to say, I, I was not an easy one to contain. Yeah. Rebel, tra- what do you mean by rebel? Just the traditional high, the traditions, the traditional high school and the, the traditional learning and it just, you know, I always felt like shaking it up. Mm -hmm. That's how I felt in high school is, um, kind of confined, I guess, you know, but always I was raised in a very conservative place. So I think that kind of made me a little more rebellious, just wanting to be, because I couldn't be accepted in that certain group you know, that was predominant. So I kind of had to be another way, but I love the way I am. I love my rebellion, but, and it was super fun. But I think in high school, I was more exploring like life, like just being free and do, and really feeling like I could do what I wanted. That's how I felt. Mm. So, you know, as far as aspiring to what I was going to be, I felt like you know, I, I had a marketing mind. That's mm. what I knew. All the classes I liked were marketing, the creative things I liked. I liked numbers. I liked math, but I didn't have passion in it. Um, so I feel like I was that was my path, yeah. you know, regardless of what I was thinking about it. Once you had a child, you know, it's, I, you know, I have two and I feel like it's, it's not easy at any point necessarily in your life. And... Um, I would think especially at that point, it's, it's not easy, you know, in general, what, um, how did that change your path? 
And what were what was going on at the time when you you had your first child at that time? Well, so I really believe this was my path, right? I think it had to happen the way it happened or mm-hmm. certain things wouldn't have happened. But I I felt so grown up. You know, like I said, I really felt like I could do what I wanted. I felt like you know, I could. And so I felt grown up and I wasn't ever afraid, um, for whatever reason, you know, but people were saying like, this will ruin your life. You're not going to be able to do the things that you wanted. And to me, that just didn't resonate. Like, of course I'm going to do what I want. Mm. You know, maybe I'm just that self-centered, but of course I prefer determined than self-centered, but yeah, (laughs) Well, when you're 17, it's self-centered. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) When you're older, you get... But, you know, maybe... But I wasn't... I didn't even know to be determined. I was naive. Mm. You know, but I didn't know what that meant. I just thought, okay, well, I'm going to have the baby. I'm going to get married. And um, I'm going to go down this path and see what happens. Now, the flip... What I really believe is... You know, I had children young because I don't think I would have done it older. You know, they may have been the thing that said, hey, chick, slow down. Like, Hmm. you don't have to go life this quickly, you know, slow down and ground a little bit. And then that's, you know, what I did. (laughs) And I want to talk about, you know, you mentioned as a kid rewriting or coming up with campaigns for whatever Oscar Mayer or UPS um, and you came up with um, sort of something iconic for Overstock. Um, so I want you to talk about that. And then initially what people's first impression was of what they thought it was. I'll, I'll let you unveil what that actually is. But it, it's yeah. catchy to say the least. So. Well, I, so in my early days, you know, within I started as a temp, cold calling, B2B calls, horrible job. It was hard, that's why it was horrible. People succeed at it, they love it, and they're really good at it. I, I struggled with it a bit, but I found success there. Um, I then asked if I could be executive assistant to Patrick. That was my, you know, when I was looking at the company and I had decided to stay, there were things I, I could do. Yeah. And Patrick on. is, for people who know, the founder, at the time, CEO. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And so these are early days, like 2002. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really viewed, like I had done the video distribution stuff, so I knew I could bring that online and I did, I brought it to Overstock. Um, and there were just so many things going on at the time. And we had a very simple dashboards, like dashboards today, and you're, you know, managing a company and you look at, pull up your dashboard every day and you get this influx of information just so much like what's affiliate marketing doing what did they do in the last hour wait what did they do in the last two seconds and you drill down in every vertical and it's just mm-hmm. insane today back then it was simple and we had two numbers <laughs> you know outside of the revenue at the end of the day um traffic numbers like how many people came in uh, through a link, right? And the links at the time were like, we had a link on the MSN homepage. That's how far back this is <laughs> before Google. Um, so what, how many people came through clicks and how many people typed over stock.com, right? So eventually I'm pulling that up every day and I start thinking, I start doing the ratio of the traffic and the truth is it held consistent. And so it's like, that's interesting. And then I did some research on um, dot com, the bubble bursting and the, all of the money that was thrown into branding and on, you know, the Super Bowl commercials and life minders and all that stuff. I read it all, did as much research as I could. Um, at the time, I think there was only one dot com person advertising on TV and that was Priceline. Hmm. Mm. And they had worked with a company that bought remnant advertising. So this is all what I'm, I'm looking at. Just, I looked at these numbers and I had the thought and I started researching all this stuff. Yeah. So I get to this agency. Then eventually my thoughts are, I think I can move that other number, hmm. right? I think I can move this number and here's how I think I can do it. So I put together 
I met with the media agency first. I um, came up with the idea and I pitched it to Patrick and said, you know, I have this idea of a woman, a brunette. Like, I really did think about it. Um, and he said, that's a good idea, but maybe we should go to some advertising agency. It's like, you've never done this before. He didn't know I had done this my entire childhood. <laughs> right. Like, I did this when I was seven. I've been doing this for a while now. My whole life. Yeah. Trust me. So, um, you know, but my point was, if you remember the O, you will remember overstock. You know, O, V, it's nine letters, like 13 when you do the dot com and back then you had the www dot like people still did that and um, So that was the idea if we can get them to remember the O. the other thing I did was look into um, Purchasing 1-800 the big O as a hmm. phone number and that was available and it was a like phone sex It, really it was? was yes, absolutely at the time <laughs> Yeah um, Did you actually purchase it end up purchasing it or yeah still the phone number? Wow. Call winning with a big O right now. Customer care will answer. <laughs> so did you, how did that work as far as approaching that company and buying it from them? Um, someone else did it. Yeah. You, you know, it, uh, I can't remember. I feel like it was like a live at the time being used, but if it wasn't being used at the time, maybe it wasn't and it had been used before. But anyway, that's, that's, we had to get it from someone that owned that stuff. <laughs> so at the time was... Overstock.com selling like sex related products or no? Oh my gosh, no. This Because I would think that all those people calling in would be very disappointed <laughs> thinking they're calling the oh, previous we, hotline and then like, it. what What do you have? At least they can sell them something. Like, well, we have this, this you know, sex yeah. line product line that you can go, oh, well, tell me about that. You know, I don't know. No, we not didn't. Not at the time. No, not at the time. <laughs> Shoot. It was so early. We were still pretty much never sat goods. Um, so he asked, said, let's get some advertising agencies that do this for a living and see what they come up with. So we did. We reached out to four or five of them. We got all the pitches, you know, and each one gave you about five. We picked the best one from each of them. But honestly, at the time, you could have inserted any brand name into the pitch. You know, and we were unique. We're different. We were so different. Their pitch didn't that. stick out. No, it wasn't like, you know, it could have been FedEx or Macy's or, you know, could have been anybody. And so we took in like June of 2003, took it to the board and pitched the six ideas, five or six ideas and discover the secret of the big O was one of them, right? So I was Yours able to was thrown in. Mine was also thrown in like the professionals, like imagine a woman sitting in a white background and I chose white because I knew the budget was going to be low. We already said I got like 40,000, you know, just pennies to do this. And so the only way to do that was with the white background, which I think was the first one, the first commercial that had a white, completely white background. Um, but it was written out just like everybody else's and they liked it. They chose mine. And so that was the beginning and they didn't know it was mine. Discover the secret of the big O. That was Discovered the tagline. The Have you discovered the secret of the big O? I remember the whole commercial. I think I could probably recite it. You know, wrote that thing over and over again in my head. Um, had to find the actress. After that, I was watching Bill O'Reilly, and I found I saw the woman doing a commercial on female incontinence, <laughs> and. I was like, what is she saying? I was so engaged that I knew that was the woman. It was like, she's talking about female leakage. I mean, she actually said those words during the commercial. And I'm thinking, you're the best, you know? <laughs> yeah. Called, yeah, it's that crazy called, tracked her down. Uh, it was a Kimberly Clark product, had to get down. It took me about three days to find her agent. Right. Found her agent, referred me to three directors found the director that would make a bet with me. Like, please, just, I mean, I think he won awards for this, but, you know, please just bet that this might be, like, if this works, I'll hire you forever. And that was the truth. We used him almost exclusively until mm. I left, the mm. same director. But, you know, we did it on a shoestring. I did it on a shoestring, wrote the script, at, finished it while we were sitting on the set. It was, it was discovering the secret, and people did. 
and we skyrocketed. We skyrocketed. Yeah. What happened after that with the company? Um, well, we were big. We were in a couple hundred million at that point. It, you know, was uh, that commercial aired in October of 2003, and over the course of the next 18 months, we were at 500 million. It was triple digit growth, and it was compressing. You know, the systems that were built, right? Because you started your dot com company with like, hey, wouldn't it be great? You know, but your technology wasn't prepared for what happened next. Mm. These were guys, the beginning of the internet isn't, you know, software as a service and, oh, we have these mods that we plug in. No, it's a long line of spaghetti code that <laughs> created something great, right? So, but when it gets pressured, you know, now everybody's like, oh, guess what we learned in the internet and retail, agile, you know, little bits at a time because the technology started rolling out so fast, the solutions that came, but we had to make a tough decision on you know, an ERP that almost took the company down at the same time. So as a result of this massive quick growth that was, you know, pressuring all of our legacy systems, um, and you could see you had to scale, the decision was made to put in the Oracle ERP system, which almost collapsed the company. <laughs> Why? Implementation. Well, Because it was so expensive? Well, there's press releases about this. Yeah. Um, it, we, we did a horrible implementation. Uh, it was a horrible imp implementation, yeah. like they lost their jobs at the time. You know, it was a, what should have been, you know, t come to find out, I was the whistleblower on this whole thing, <laughs> internally, by the way, because things were breaking. Um, turns out that this should have been an 18 month project that, you know, the technical, whoever's in charge, thought we could get done in about four months or something ridiculous. but. You know, so we were we were trying to do the impossible, mm. and it it was impossible. Now, in the end, it all worked out. We it took the time that you know they suggested. It really does take that long, but it all worked out. But yeah, the hundred million dollars, the the stress on the organization. You know, when you're switching technologies and stuff, huge you don't stress. Growing at a you know you're growing and you've got to make a move. You know, you've got to be super careful and more than surgical hands because these are custom this is customer data. You know, it's it's so precious. And especially at that time, people weren't as concerned. You didn't have these protect it was a different world. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, that's what Discover the Secret of the Big O catapulted to the Oracle ERP. And then we pulled out pretty good in about two thousand six and seven. What was, you know, Stormy, the evolution of some of the products? Um, when you were there that you guys actually sold and then when you were president? Yeah, we had a, you know, when I began, it was true overstock and you had Amazon, eBay and really the overstock never came to those as big as them as far as their revenue or, you know, whatever they did. Um, at the time, those were the players and it really, you know, you had books, you had auctions and you had goods, but the goods that we had were, whatever was for sale, right? The true liquidation world. And honestly, e-commerce took away the ability, you know, Overstock, what Overstock was founded on, that idea of liquidation goods, e-commerce dissolved that, right? Because they were these goods were no longer on a shelf. They're sitting in another click away on sale under the merchandiser's umbrella. So it doesn't yeah. even have to liquidate some, through another channel. But at the time, that's what it was. So we would have pots and pans, we would have vacuums, we would have things that nobody else was touching. And, you know, UPS, all of that, it was just another thing. It wasn't these massive, you know, logistics companies like, like e-commerce has made them today. Mm -hmm. um, but that's how we got into couches and, you know, big rugs. In 2001, Overstock was named Rug Retailer of the Year. Mm. This is insane time to be that when you're an online retailer selling rugs online. You know, think of the shipping or trying to get that to your doorstep in 2001. It, it wasn't easy. Yeah, those were the things. So we figured out those things early because we had to adapt to whatever came in the door. Like, oh, we bought a jewelry company and we have all these diamonds coming in. Okay, we need a jewelry cage. We need this equipment. We need all of these things to support it. And by those random purchases, we eventually had departments. Like, oh, guess what? We can touch diamonds anytime now. We have 
we have the means to move them through. Hmm. You know, we kept our merchandise, you know, almost 100% our own. Um, and over the course of time, you know, as we start developing partners, visiting ma um, manufacturers, warehouses, helping them ship, helping them pack, teaching them about e-commerce, selling them on the dream, we could not take their inventory in our warehouse and teach them to ship out of theirs. Mm. The consumer versus to, you know, the, R the RC Willys and Furniture Marts of the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it started catching on. You know, we apparel we would always have to buy online that was a slow industry to you know really get into e-commerce even if they have yet and um that's how we evolved and started building these apartments we were the first in furniture and had those relationships first um but overstock became really the first multi-department store online to mm. where it was really multi-departments and it was by chance you know because of how we you know because of our name overstock we'll come buy your goods and but it really did allow us to do many things because once you built the back system for it, you could do it forever. Once you built the idea of customer service around it, you might as well just keep doing it forever because the learning curve was expensive there. What was the toughest part about being president? I mm. mean, there's 1,600 employees. That seems daunting. I would say, like at the time um, when I became president, Patrick, or take that back. When I became president, the CMO was also moved to another project. I think it was along the Bitcoin, um, the cryptocurrency side of our business. He was moved to that. And it took us quite a while to backfill that. So the first months of my impact to the point that I had to go back and ask him to take over because I just it was too hard to be a brand new president and also go in as CMO again um, that was a really tough tough time it was hard those are both massive jobs and it was tough to take now um, what I should say is before I became sole president in 2014 I became co-president in 2013 and um, in so I had a, a partner that had marketing for that first, <laughs> the first little bit. And in 2014, he was demoted and um, I was made sole president and then had to take on marketing as well. Hmm. That was, was a tough time. Um, once I backfilled those positions with super great people, um, I would say the toughest time was trying to unravel. You know, we talk about the tech, but it was still, you know, even though it was, 2014 uh, still the, the technology that is built that you now have way better options for you need to transfer it's the best thing you can do is transfer it's expensive and it's difficult and it was a job nobody wanted to take on but when I became president it was the first thing I wanted to do because I knew it I knew in the end that that saves money and I knew it's the hardest thing we were ever going to have to do. So I used to tell people, we're just building Rome next to Rome. Like, you <laughs> know, in the old days, they just built Rome on top of Rome. We don't have that luxury. <laughs> we have to actually build it next to it and move all the people over to the new Rome as it's happening. And so that was hard, but rewarding. So rewarding to complete those connections and you know, know that the, the technology is agile and flexible and, you know, that's a good feeling. Hmm. Now, you obviously worked closely with Patrick, who's the founder of Overstock. Uh, why don't you talk about, I mean, he had a vision of this online thing before oh, most yeah. people did, you know, and yeah. also before consumers were even fully trusting, you know, online. Um, what did you see, um, you know, working closely with him as some of the lessons um, or some of the things that you saw as far as his vision went? Um, you know, I think in the beginning, when I go back to those beginning days, uh, you know, I think there was a lot of moments where Patrick never dreamed that he would be attached to the organization as long as he was, mm -hmm. that in, you know, in much of the business world, people acquire companies to flip companies. You know, that's a lot of what's going on. Folks buy companies, but they never think, I can't wait to run it. You know, <laughs> they don't right. want to. They buy them and they, they sell them. They optimize them and sell them. Now, 
you know, e-commerce is an addicting, you know, at the time it was addicting, right? Because you were really on a blank whiteboard. You couldn't call somebody and be like, hey, what's your services? I'm building a company and I need some customer care equipment like you can now. Right. Because, okay, we've got a bunch more customers. We got to, you had to figure it out. How do you market online? Those were questions. I be I started the marketing department. The first of, we were three people, and we just went and sat in a room and went, "Okay, we're the marketing department. What's our spend? What do we do? What is current? And then what are we building?" Um, so I think for Patrick, you know, it was a lot of discovery along the way because nobody knew when we were there exactly what the vision was or if people were going to adopt it or what the environment was going to be and how it would really revol- evolve out of overstocked mm. merchandise. Um, we, but yeah. No, I was going to say, you know, um, we don't have to go too deep into it, but Patrick has been in the news as of late. Um, and you will probably do a better job of explaining what is in the news. You don't have to comment your opinion on it, but some of the things that whatever, I don't know, who knows what's, what's true and what's not, but some of the things that are, that's going on currently. Yeah, pretty hot topic as of the past week, you know. Um, yeah, I can talk about, I left in ju- uh, July of 16, so that's, you know, I been, I left the board in September of 16. So that's where, you know, my overstock journey absolutely ends. Patrick's events as of late, you know, speaking about his relationship with Maria Butina and, you know, connections or belief in political espionage that was happening regarding the Clinton investigation and the Russian investigation. And that's what the core of it is. Mm. Now, you know, have I read the articles? Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, yes. I look for the meat, you know, like I am still like everyone reading and waiting for things to unravel or unroll or whatever is to happen next. I think that, you know, it's been an interesting intro and, you know, the guts of which he's definitely while on his news interviews, which were pretty rampant that day, uh, you know, he, he was dropping breadcrumbs. That's how I viewed it. There's Mm. breadcrumbs being dropped and, you know, eventually hopefully a hen comes along and pecks them all up and we finally you know, the story yeah. or however that works, but or Hansel and Grant, Gretel come along and pick them up. But, um, you know, that's where it's at. I think it's, it's complicated. You know, it's complicated no matter what way you slice it. The company, you know, it's people view the company in different ways because some people view it as a crypto, uh, well, a blockchain company supporting cryptocurrencies and all of these different, you know, portfolios within Medici. And some people are really liked retail and they say, no, this was what happened to overstock. And I think that that's a complicated story too. Mm -hmm. So there's many complications when you talk about overstock, you know, Patrick layering, um, this on top of it is, is surprising. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about cannabis for a second. Um, how did you get involved with can kids? Well, in when I decided to leave Overstock, I I was watching Colorado. I really was like thinking about this this time in our history that was starting to be written, like barely words on paper about the end of a prohibition. And that caught my eye. I am a cannabis supporter. I don't shy away from that anymore. I I don't think it's made me a bad person ever. And um, hasn't made any of my friends a bad person. And, you know, I know a lot of people that cloak it. Um, But, you know, I raised my hand for it. I was on LinkedIn one day. It really happened just like this, February 2016. I'm on LinkedIn. I was writing with someone. We're driving. I was talking about this cannabis industry. And I go, and they go, why don't you look to see what jobs are out there? And I said, that's brilliant. Go on LinkedIn, type in cannabis, sponsored ad comes up. It's like COO president of a cultivation center in Denver. I open it. I'm like, oh, that sounds good. Apply with profile. Click. Didn't think about it. Um, they call back. I'm like, well, actually, I think 
I don't know, it was like June, and I said, just give me some time, because I knew, you know, what I was doing, and um, in July, I called Pac, and we totally worked it out, and I started there in September, about 20 days before I came off the board of Overstock, which I kind of just love that there's a crossover, because people at the time were putting cannabis and such a stigma on it, and how terrible it was, and how, I can't tell you the number of times I heard, well, it's illegal, that's why you don't do it, it's illegal, um, but I did it anyway. And I went to a grow. I had other people also saying, no, wait, there's some people going to make some investments. Come join the echelon. Come join the echelon. I couldn't wait to go get my hands dirty with the plant hmm. to really get the scoop on what is happening. So I joined a place. They had a 90,000 square foot grow, which is huge, but I was coming from a million square feet of warehouse space. So I thought it was tiny. And managing it came easy to me and the supply chain and how some efficiencies and just looking at it a little differently. But I stayed there for six months. They had two medicinal dispensaries, which were amazing because I met patients. And I really started learning about not only the care of this plant and the growth and what goes into it, because it's a lot. Growing this plant, more goes into growing this plant under state regulations than goes into growing any of the food that you're eating. Just so you know, it's safer as far as pesticides, anything, than any food you can eat, safest. So there's a lot more going into this, right? Mm -hmm. um, I learned all of that. And six months in, after an offer of equity in the position, I had learned so much about medicine. I'm getting to can of kits now um, that I was kind of panicked about the way that the political system of the early days in the 30s had suppressed this plant and the reasons that it did so. Hmm. And I went kind of deep into the history of the plant and all the things that have happened to it and the reasons why. Uh, and it really turned me toward a medicinal course because I honestly, I had joined, I really thought recreational was you know, going to be the big thing. And I really am an advocate for recreational or adult use as the new term. But I really think that we should own the plant, not pharmaceutical companies. However, the research on medicine is leading the way. And I met Tracy Ryan, whose daughter was diagnosed at eight months with a brain tumor. The thought of chemo really terrified this family with this little baby. And they went for alternative options. And she, you know, she'll say she woke up and kind of just got a message that she should look into cannabis. It wasn't, she didn't know. And she started to and started looking and, you know, did the really hard job of experimenting with your child. But one thing that she knew for sure was no matter what happened, that cannabis was going to be just was safer than chemo. So even if it didn't work, it wouldn't harm. Right. In this case, it worked. Hmm. And it just gives me chills, right? It, it worked. And it works for many children. And for Tracy at the time, you know, early... 2016, Calif or two, yeah, 2016, California hadn't gone recreational yet. There were all kinds of things not, and even medicinal, the laws were way out of control in California. They've been tolerated for so long um, that I just wanted to help her. You know, can of kids by name is a controversial subject, and three years ago, even more so. But in 2017, I joined um, her advisory board, so I start talking about it, and you know, getting getting the attention that we need for this plant on children and the idea that a mom and dad with the help of people who have continued to study this plant underground for years, um, with the help of them, they were actually able to create a medicine that was providing results and not just for Sophie, but for many people, many people, many people to me can be three, four. It's enough. You know, if it works for five and fails on 500, that's a great story yeah. for five. Yeah, totally. So, you know, but this was especially done. something that doesn't have like a negative side effect, right? So, mm -hmm. even if it, like you were saying, if she takes it, worst case, nothing happens. Best case, it helps. Yeah, you know, I had these conversations about people when you know I first started talking about this, and they would say, "Yeah, well, what do you think about it? you're you know you're getting a child high?" And I get really caught up on that. And what I point out is all the videos on YouTube of kids taking, getting their wisdom teeth out or they're going yeah. to the dentist and they're all drugged up. They're drugged up. They're high. They're high. Yeah, you the could dentist. watch the YouTube videos of the kid in the back seat right after he 
got something pulled and it goes viral because he's acting they, like drunk. Their yeah. parents, their parents right. are laughing, and it is funny. But we're not taught. We're not. It's, why doesn't that not have a stigma? That is getting our child high. It's needed. Right. You know, they have to. But you know, is there? There's no stigma attached right. to that. That's okay because someone told us a long time ago that Dennis can do that. But nobody's. You know, everybody said, but the plant doesn't work. Now, what if that plant, a plant, could provide the same numbing? Not just this plant, but a plant. That we know is good for our child. But yeah, maybe. Maybe they act a little goofy. But chemically, it's doing okay. You know, why is it that a child, you know, God help us, that they, if they're sitting there with cancer, that we can give them something that makes them laugh. You know? Maybe that's a joy. You know, and help them with their pain and fight cancer cells and boost your CBD, your endocannabinoid system, and do all of those things. You know, getting them high should be the least of our questions. Mm. You know, we give our children all kinds of synthetic drugs and they're needed. I don't want to mom shame, pill shame. None of that applies here. These are our children. We take care of them. They need to function in a very high stress society. These children will have more stress than you and I have ever dreamed of because they're getting information at nine months old. They're learning to swipe a phone. They're pushing what I want to appeal to them at nine months old. Yeah, I don't know how they're gonna cope, right? Yeah, but increase in Ritalin. It's uh, true. Yeah, it's, there's it's totally. All and these kids are under stress. Their lives are exposed. They're constantly on Facebook. They're fine sending videos. It's it's the most interesting thing we're gonna see. But you know, it doesn't make make it healthiest. Yeah, but we're really caught up on cannabis. <laughs> you know I, what I mean? I suggest anyone go to cannakids.org and then there's a tab. You can read Sophie's story, and it's pretty remarkable. Um, of her journey, you know. Um, it talk just about, gives me chills yeah. every time I talk about it. I've talked about it for years, but it still does. Yeah, I'm just looking at it off the side here, but you know, when you can induce something that's more natural for someone that helps their body heal itself is always, you know, more beneficial if you can do that as opposed to something else, you know? Well, and I, you know, we should say Kofi, Kofi, Sophie is on chemo and traditional Mm -hmm. therapies. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, she didn't abandon one to replace one. Mm -hmm. She did both at the same time. Right. And they've done things where she comes off of the um, cannabis for a little bit and they watch the tumor. So, you know, she's got doctors involved. There are hospitals involved. Yeah. This has now entered a very balanced, beautiful type of research where, you know, nobody's saying chemo should be thrown out the window. That is never anybody in cannabis's story. It's like it should be included. It should right. be included as an option and as a medicine and maybe the first step before, you know, you zap your body if you need to. They have some products. What are some of the popular ones? For um, you know, I the tinctures, the tinctures are always good, and you really consider them for pediatric and geriatric because of the ability um, to sublingually, you know, soak under your tongue. You mm-hmm. don't have to swallow pills; it's easy to take. Um, anything of the CBD is great. You know, hundred percent CBD. It's for everyone. You know, these aren't just medicines for people with cancer. You know, but when you do go to dispensaries and medicinal dispensaries as a patient, folks, you know, the bud tenders there are pretty well versed in talking to you about it because I know there's this moment where can of kids is a medicine. You know, these products you're looking at, we consider a medicine, mm-hmm. but they're going to be sold in a store without a doctor. Um, and that's what I found really interesting in my early cannabis days was the people delivering the information and making suggestions about the plant to sick people and then going back on what they say or asking them the questions and them knowing it and being fairly confident yeah. um, what they're saying is correct, you know, and then the, the feedback from the patients comes right back to them, you know, so it was a really interesting community. And I think Canna Kids has that same sort of, you know, place on the shelf. Where? What's the legality of like if someone wants to purchase something on this site? How does it work, or do they have to? How does that work as far as you have to be a certain state? Or? Yeah, anything with uh, THC. First of all, I, I 
you know, purchasing online in the state of California, you can have products delivered to you, but not mailed. Hmm. So you can order online, you can order things in a store, and it's really dispensary specific. So here, uh, I honestly don't know right now if we are selling the CBD direct to consumers. Yeah. But anything with THC or full plant spectrum, we would be unable to ship anywhere, um, even in the state of California, but would only be able to sell in California. So what do they do? They just have a courier go deliver it or? Well, yeah. Well, Canna Kids doesn't. You have to work through dispensaries. Uh, Ah, got it. So you yeah. you make aware you're made aware of it through the site, but you really have to go to a dispensary to get it. I gotcha. Yeah. So eventually, your overstock.com abilities will, and the laws match up with it, and it can actually be fulfilled easier for people. Yes. Yeah, so I walk into this industry, and I'm like, I got all kinds of artilleries for e-commerce right. and digital to an industry that doesn't allow any of it. Right. They're like, check your check your artillery at the door. For this Check right now, right. <laughs> yeah. really interesting. Um, yeah, so everyone check out Canakids dot com uh, or dot org rather. It's C A N N A K I D S. Um, so tell me what's next or now future for you in cannabis, and if you want to talk about Tribe Talks as well, and oh, what's going on with that. I do want to talk about cannabis just one more second. Yeah, go ahead. Um, because of that involvement that I have with the medicinal side and, you know, the advocacy of, I, I have against big pharma with this plant. Um, on the flip side of that, I'm on the board of high times. And that's important to me because they have been a big supporter of the plant for 45 years. Um, but single handedly for the cannabis community and all the farmers and the growers that were really delivering about $56 billion in a network that couldn't exist for our government. Um, and many of them, do see themselves as farmers and many of them do see this as a medicine and have their entire career, which is sometimes third generation. Um, that's who high time supported them throughout all those years, single handedly when it wasn't safe. And, um, so to be on their board was really important to me on this industry Mm. because it was my connection also and my education for cannabis, uh, growing up and my curiosities and all of that. So I serve both sides medicinal and, uh, the, idea for legal use um even though high times does of course support medicinal progress search and all the conferences and things like that but it's important that consumers remember that if we give this plant to the fda and that's what will happen they will own this and you do not have a homegrown law in your state or a recreational law in your state just think about what that could mean for plants Something to think about, right? Because it's a plant. You know, I look out my door, I have some lavender. I believe lavender has healing abilities, just like I do with cannabis. I sincerely believe that has calming abilities, could start combating Xanax maybe or or certain things, right? I'm not sure. Yeah. Don't know research, but I believe that. Do we, are we really sure that we want to push it strictly into the hands of the government or do we need a hybrid of these laws? Because I pay when I took a lot of farms, not a lot of pharmaceutical medicines, but you know, when I was on my uh, trazodone for sleep, that wasn't cheap, right? In Expensive. my insurance life, I was paying maybe $30 a month, but you know, someone else was paying 500. Right. That's what happens when we enter big pharma right now. And it's always has been, this isn't as much as it's costing in the stores. Oils, tinctures, they've been around for decades. It's just if you knew where to get them. But these medicines have been going around healing people for decades. Now, the research is being underground. It's important. It's so important we get it done. But I also fear giving the government plants as a medicine. There is a reason that the FDA has not approved the products that you find in your local GNC store. They're not set up to make money off it. This will be the first plant that I can think of that gets approved as a medicinal benefit and begged to be put into the pharmaceuticals hands and they are positioning themselves to take control of it. Now, it's a conundrum, right? And it's one I found myself in, in this industry. Where, how do I, where do I, how does this all make sense? Because it still doesn't to me, you know, yes, I want the medical research. I want plants as a medicine. We need to research that more as a country for our people. Um, On the other hand, 
the corporate structure, which absolutely exists today and is locked and loaded and stuff with a lot of organizations, supports a synthetic, um, reactive pharmace- uh, medicine. We are not about being well. We are about how being sick and take this. Get sick, take this. But we're not about, hey, take this and stay well. Right. That's what plants will do. So that is what plants can do. You know, we learn it every day, but we can all be more diligent and being healthier, but we need to keep our voice. We need to keep our voice. I don't need permission from the FDA for marijuana and I never have. And I don't today. Um, but when you get past the stigma and you get past the, you know, the history and you get to the heart of it, which I did, which was the beginning. And then you take away all of that and look at this as just a plant, just a plant. It just was growing. Why does someone have to own it? You know, research should be done because it's best for the people, but ownership could cost a lot of money for the people. You know, that same plant could be $5,000 next month. So you're saying if for it to get approved, it should be approved recreationally so it doesn't get taken over as much by the FDA and they hike up the price essentially. Yeah, plants are for people. We grow celery, we grow tomatoes, we grow cucumbers. It's just a plant. You can grow hops and barley if you want. It's just a plant. You can grow cactus. You know what I mean? And I think that that idea because, you know, plants as a medicine were years ago, right? Before the American Medical Association, when people had brooms and were sweeping their seeds in a garden. You know, it goes back to yeah. a paganistic world um, almost where herbs were the medicine. Yeah. I mean, if you oh, go to, you know, that's why they call it Eastern versus Western, right? You go to Eastern medicine, they use mushrooms and spice, turmeric, and other things for healing. Yes. And then we got into this world where, you know, it was all just forgotten and not only forgotten, but condemned, you know, to where, oh, medicine will only be this and only provided by these, this group, you know, and that, I mean, it sounds simplistic, but eventually that's how, that's how it is. I mean, it's what the system is. Yeah. And social media, uh, technology and this the idea that we can communicate in the broad senses that we do now has given the people the power to push their voices and what they want as a medicine and what they're finding and connecting, you know, and saying, oh, I had that, I had that too. Like, oh, my child has cancer. I'm desperate. I can now find people that had success with something outside of what the only you know, you're walking into a doctor's office, you only get one or two choices because that's all they have. Yeah. But other countries have many. Other countries have retreats and wellness and, you know, so it's it's an interesting thing to start breaking down. But, geez, that's what cannabis did for me you know, yeah. when I got in the industry. Um, and that's that's what I hope people remember is it really is just a plant. And But many plants, many of them have these same type of properties you know, it's not the only one with cannabinoids in them, you know, or that this, the only plant that provides similar assists for your endocannabinoid system. Yeah. Um, there's many. No, I totally appreciate you sharing that story and you're preaching to the choir here. I am uh, preaching. Be, yeah, you're preaching to the choir to me. I mean, I totally, you know, am on, uh, you know, the sense of the, the system and what people's mindset and paradigm around quote unquote health care is, is not really health care it's sick care and it's great for sick care it's great for um if there is a, a major issue but for keeping people well it's it's not equipped you know what i mean and it's totally so you're preaching to the choir here and, and, and you know things are i think um people are becoming more aware they're becoming healthier they co- things are their mindset in general is changing to wow like eating food can keep me healthier and keep me well and they're going towards a more of a wellness mindset than, oh, I'll just take this pill when something happens. Well, not thinking of the cause and then preventing it. So totally. And pointing yeah. out that all of that movement has not been done by our government or our FDA or, an Amer- or, or the American Medical Association. 
it's been done through people learning and sharing their experiences on social media. But yeah. there's no campaign about, hey, world, I'm the American Medical Association and I got something to share with you. <laughs> Here's all the stuff we learned about everything that's going to make yeah. you healthy this year. Here's everything we know about medicine for you to make you better. Yeah. It's a lot yeah. of documentaries and people sharing, yeah, like documenting yeah. their their uh, journey. Um, so Tribe Talks. Oh, Tribe Talks. Yes. Um so all these stories, and even the last one where I did absolutely preach, has led me to want to create a platform to where the, these real stories are shared. I think a lot of the cannabis news right now is $4 billion going into one company or um, you know, this investment or this merger, and it is all about the big, big business, and that's what you know most of the people hear about. But underneath it all are some amazing, not only beautiful stories, hmm. but unfair stories. Uh, the social justice connected with this plant still being addressed. I, I commend all the governors that are really just saying, look, we're going, we're going to go legal and we're going to just write off and expunge everybody's records. It gives me chills. Like, please be fair. And, um, but you hear these stories, people that can't work in the industry because they had a joint on a corner 20 years ago, you know, things like that. Um, but also the stories of the moms and the people that have been doing it for many years and those that, you know, uh, have had great successes too, the big money too. But it's time to really let the tribe talk. And my tribe is comprised of cannabis business folks, uh, very successful. One is a woman that, um, Autumn Carsey, who builds large grows. She's almost an architect and she grows some of the best cannabis with the best care and knowledge and science. And she came up scrappy and she's amazing. And one of the only women I know doing it in the business. Uh, Joshua Krosny is the cannabis science conference. And so he's put on the only cannabis science conference in the business. And that's been a huge source of education for me. And then Leah Heiss, who is a compliance attorney for one of the larger brands um, and comes to us. She was on disability for 12 years before cannabis entered her life. Hmm. And now she is a top player in the industry and she takes on a lot of stress and she's working full time. But before cannabis, she wasn't. She was 12 years at home. And that's the tribe. So not only do the tribe have their own stories, but you know we have um, the ability to really get the right stories to folks and talk about it. And you know maybe in the sense of a daily show or you know the View or something, where it's a lot of fun too. Where can we? First of all, Stormy, thank you. Thank you for sharing your journey. Um, thank you for sharing your views and. The, the work you've done already in the cannabis industry and will continue to, where should we point people towards? Um, so online. Talks, yeah, the Tribe Talks will launch October 1st is our hopeful launch date. And then online, I'm on Facebook, mm -hmm. Stormy Summon. Um, a, a, what do they call them? A business page, business profile, or whatever that's called, a secondary one. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty you know, accessible. I mm -hmm. love connecting with people and listening to their stories or checking them out, whatever it is. So people can go to, is it tribetalks.com or what's the? Tribetalks.com will be the website. Got it. The tribe talk, it's actually the tribetalks.com, the tribe talks on Facebook. Got it. Each one right now is a holding place and we're okay. looking to get those up by October 1st. So go to the tribetalks.com or, and I do encourage everyone to listen to Stormy's TED Talk. You can find that on YouTube. Maybe it's on her site somewhere. Check out canakids.org. And Stormy, I want to be the first one to just thank you. Thank you so much. I have enjoyed this so much. Thank you me for too. having me. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand right now. I feel like a hundred grand.